In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, our true freedom and the way to eternal life. Amen. Well, I don't know about you, but when I was young, I had actually a rainbow piece of material, which I used to use a clothes peg to wrap around my neck and tie just there. I, I put my adult version of this on today with a little button here. And I used to run around the house trying to make it blow out behind me like this lovely lady in my background is demonstrating. And this made me feel so good. I felt free, alive, as if, I, as if I was invincible. Well, you might have guessed it. Uh, I'm going to be alluding to the mantle, which we experienced as part of the first lesson today. And this first lesson is from the second book of the Kings, which is an interesting name for this book, really, because it actually talks about the prophets of old. And we witness these two prophets of old, Elijah and Elisha, the two who also appeared at Jesus' transfiguration as visions either side that the disciples said, oh, we need to build a hut for either of those as well as Jesus to make a monument to this ama amazing event. So it's these two that we are witnessing in their setting, in the ancient world, being prophets and this is the time when Elijah, who had been prophet of the Most High, prophet to the people of Israel, and prophet to the kings who had wandered away from God and not listening to God, and he is coming to the end of his ministry. He's about to die. He knows this. And so he sets out on three journeys to see three different groups of people as a farewell. Now, Elisha is his mentee. He's been mentor to Elisha on the ways of profiting, and he wants to come with him on these journeys. Now, Elijah says to Elisha, no, no, stay here. It's okay. I know what I'm doing. I need to go visit these three places before I die, but you don't need to. You can stay. Well, Elisha demonstrates his faithfulness. No, I'm coming with you. Wherever you go, I'm coming. So they set off. And on the way, we hear about how Elijah takes off the mantle, something which would have been a little bit like a cape or possibly even some of the robes that we wear in the church, like the chasuble or the surplice that goes over the top of the black one. These things are actually biblically related. We don't just wear them for fun, funnily enough. Anyway, he takes off this mantle, rolls it up into like some sort of big thick wad of material and smacks the water and parts this river so that they can cross and go on their way. This is important for us to note at this stage. Anyway, then they get into a conversation about the succession planning of profiteering. And this prophet, Elijah, says, well, what is it that you would wish for your ministry, Elisha? You're going to be taking over in some sense. Elisha says, give me a double measure of your spirit. Now, he's not saying, you know, I want to be a better prophet than you are. I want to do it two times better. Rather, he is honoring Elijah's ministry and recognizing that without the same spirit that was in Elijah, Elisha wouldn't be able to minister. But also the way that um, succession or also inheritance worked in this time was that a father would give to the firstborn son a double measure of inheritance in comparison to the rest of this offspring who would have got maybe a third or a fourth or a fifth measure. So this is really recognizing that Elijah is passing the torch, but in this sense, passing the mantle onto Elisha. Now, the next part is that uh, there's this recognition that Elisha has to really stay with Elijah to the end, like already committed to come on the journey, but has to stay to see Elijah being taken up. And Elijah's ascension is much like Moses was and definitely like Jesus was. The body went too. So there was not going to be anything left of Elijah for Elisha to bury and honor and mourn over. And in this time when it actually starts happening, the chariots arrive. The real vision that is seen here is recognizing that these people, the prophets, were truly the ones appointed by God and the kings, the rulers of Israel, were not. So that is what that is about. But also it is about this moment when Elisha is then able to inherit this ministry of Elijah 
and the mantle is the one thing that falls off Elijah as he's been lifted up. And Elisha takes it on. And what is the first thing that Elisha does with the mantle? Roll it on up. Get ready for the next step of the journey to be the prophet who is taking on the ministry, whacking the water, making a way. So important. So why have we started with this today when we also have some really, really juicy things in our other lessons? Well, I think it's wonderful for us to begin here, not just because I really fancy myself as a cape wearer, and maybe you'd like to join me in that, in remembering what it's like to pop something on your shoulders and, and maybe get some wind behind it. But because this mantle, this mantle of ministry being passed from one prophet to another is something that we can take up to. And we're going to reflect a little bit more on the Christian mantle, what it is that every Christ follower has to wrap around their shoulders, maybe get a bit of wind as they go on their way. So the Christian mantle, I believe, is one of freedom. And this is where we're going to jump into the second lesson today, this excerpt from the letter of St. Paul to the Galatians. And Paul is writing to a community that, one, he really loves, and two, that is facing a lot of ambiguity in how they go about following Jesus, particularly in relation to the law. We covered that a little bit in last week's readings, that the law was a matter of confusion. Those who were Jewish converts to Christianity, do they continue in the law? Those who are not, do they then have to become Jewish to then become Christian? And this excerpt that we have begins with, for freedom, Christ has set us free. And this freedom that Paul is talking about is freedom from quite a few things, not just from being obligated to follow the law, black and white, see things as they absolutely must be. And anyone who fails is then condemned, but also freedom from judgment freedom from fear of what happens in the afterlife, what happens after we die, and freedom from what would hold these people back from one another, which is around that salvation. And that salvation is no longer earned. Salvation has been given as a gift through the work of Jesus. So Christian freedom is not about license to sin. You know, we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. The law still has things to teach us. And the law, as it has been summed up by both Jesus as well as Paul, is to love your neighbor as yourself. Love one another. If we do that, using some of the things from the law, then it will be far more likely that we live in line with what our salvation and our Christian freedom means. And it's really important that we pick up on what's going on in this passage also with the contrast that's presented. So first, the things of the flesh are presented in saying these are the things that Christians have to let go of. Now, although there's some things in there that we're, we probably definitely could say, yes, we don't want to live licentiously or loosely. We certainly don't want to live with enmity or greed at our center. We don't want to set ourselves up as opposites to other people. But there's also some other things in there. There's some things which sometimes humans do this as part of their freedom. Well, let's not look at this as black and white as we would in the law, but rather look at this as an example of some of the things that can cause division between us. Some of the things that would set us up as judges of one another. And that's really important. Christian freedom does not set us up as license to go about sinning, knowing that Jesus forgives us and that we're okay. We can just keep doing the bad things. No, Christian freedom is about being set free from the criticism that often comes up for us. It could be that little voice going, oh gosh, that person's doing that. Well, they're a bad person because of that. Could also be the self-criticism that can come up, that inner voice of doubt within us saying, oh, you are a wicked creature. Why would you be wanting to even think of that? When a natural inclination might come up within us, we're human after all. And that humanness sometimes does bubble up in ways that we can't quite hold down. So we're seeking to really live into this freedom and we don't have to worry about obtaining status or salvation 
through getting things right all the time. And we don't have to judge one another when things go wrong and when perhaps we need to try again next time. What that big long list of fleshly actions is opposed to or set up as a contrast with by Paul in this passage is with the fruits of the spirit. And this is fantastic. Perhaps we've had a chance to sit with the fruits of the spirit before. I know it's definitely been part of my Sunday school upbringing, uh, but it is a wonderful place for us to really understand what is being offered to us in our Christian freedom. And these things are wonderful. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and the last one, self-control. Ooh, just thinking about putting that mantle on again, that self-control. Now, the thing about the fruits of the spirit is that these are not things we have to work at obtaining ourselves. They are things that we need to work at practicing, but they don't belong to us. These are things which belong to the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit then gifts to us. So we have to do the work in making sure that we are trying to make room for the spirit to work through us, but we don't have to generate these on our own. So that could be perhaps a little bit of a relief. And thinking of it in contrast to the things of the flesh, that's not saying the body is evil or that our human inclinations are really going to put us in separation from God and others. But if we act on those things in a way that does, it's the fruits of the spirit that will bring us back, that will make a way for us to really take that mantle on, that mantle of ministry and of sharing the good news that salvation is no longer earned and you don't have to work towards status in community or with God by getting things right and being perfect all the time, but rather it is about grace and it's about looking on ourselves as well as one another with that grace and accepting that freedom. So lastly, we're going to delve into the gospel and this gospel passage is often named the cost of discipleship. That's what my study Bible names this little excerpt, the cost of discipleship. Now, remembering that we're, we're sticking with freedom here, especially that freedom mantle that we get to put on as Christians. Looking at this and taking the context into consideration is so important. So first of all, Jesus is setting his face towards Jerusalem, similar to Elijah, knowing that his time is drawing near. And this time for the work of salvation is drawing near. He sets his face towards Jerusalem. Now, this doesn't mean that he takes a completely direct route. You know, he doesn't go, okay, Jerusalem's over here and I'm here right now. I need to go this many kilometers. It's going to take me this many days and I'm going to set out right now. Setting his face towards Jerusalem really is about going into a different phase of his ministry. And this phase is when he does do a lot of succession planning work of trying to empower the disciples to truly grasp what ministry means for Jesus, but also what ministry will mean for them and for us. So as part of this succession planning, there's a few things we can really learn in this passage. So Jesus travels through a Samaritan village and this Samaritan village will not offer hospitality. Now, this was quite normal in these days. The Samaritans really resented the amount of Jewish pilgrims who were coming through, making a mess of their town, taking up all of their resources as they went to temple in Jerusalem every single year. So they decided, no, enough is enough. We're looking after ourselves. We can't actually sustain this. So you need to go by a different route. Now the disciples, such an interesting reaction. Lord, shall we call down fire and smite these wicked people who would not offer you hospitality? Don't they know who you are? Instead of turning around and saying, yeah, you know what? Let's teach the Samaritans lesson. Jesus says, mm -mm. he rebukes his disciples. No, that is not what ministry is in my name. So that's interesting for us to hold on to. The next part, Jesus encounters some different people who would really like to follow. People who have good intentions and think, yes, this is the Messiah. This is the one I want to follow. I would like to dedicate my life to following him. Now, the first of these says, yes, I'm going to do this. But first, Lord, let me go and bury my father. Jesus' reaction here might seem really insensitive to someone who is mourning. Let the dead bury their own dead. 
but actually contextually if this young man actually needed to bury his father because his father was recently deceased he wouldn't have been anywhere near Jesus he would have been completely wrapped up in the plans for funeral in whatever comes next for uh, inheriting what his father was giving on and taking up that role so the conversation wouldn't have even been happening if this man's father was already dead so what this tells us is that this young man or maybe not so young not really sure was waiting for his father to die. So he was saying, yes, in a couple of years after I have come into my inheritance and I am a person of more importance than I am now, of course, I'll dedicate myself to you, Jesus. But right now I need to look out for these interests and ensure that I'm there because if I'm not there, the inheritance will go to somebody else. Hmm, okay. <laughs> Next, there's someone who really wants to follow Jesus but needs to say farewell to those who are at home first. Now, this is perhaps a little bit softer, and in this time we could see that. But actually, during Jesus' day, there were lots of folk who felt that they needed to go out into the world to find a new way of being, and they couldn't stay in their family business, as it were, and take on that kind of succession. So this young person wants to go and make sure that the affairs are in order, that they are going to be able to set out with the best resources possible, maybe even taking a share of their inheritance with them. Mm, no, anyone who looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God now. So that really calls us into this urgency. There's an urgency to following Jesus. It's about now as well as eternity. And the kingdom of God to be inherited here and now is about taking on that mantle of ministry, carrying it. And it might be one of freedom, but there is also responsibility involved in that. So although this passage is the cost of discipleship, it is saying that the things of this world that used to tie you down, so family connections, but also inheritances and trying to assume a role of status in community, we have to let that go. It's hard work, but the things that hold us back are the things that Jesus sets us free from. So just to list a few of those things that might hold us back, we've seen that these things could be perhaps behaving in a certain way in the Galatians reading, the things of the flesh, those can hold us back from living into the fruits of the spirit. The self-criticism and also the judgment of others can also hold us back from truly living the gospel together and taking up that mantle of freedom. It could be that there are some roles that we think we need to fulfill in this life, things that are put on us. Perhaps these are family expectations or other expectations that we set ourselves. If God is calling, there will be a way forward and we don't have to worry about how it looks to others or what we are missing out on if we go forward in faith. God will provide. And lastly, if there is something Perhaps it is something we feel that is unfinished for us, that we have to get done before we live out our ministry, before we answer God with a yes, I'll put on that mantle. We don't need to wait. We can do that right now. And that is because for freedom, Christ has set us free. So next time you're putting on a scarf or a jacket or perhaps a blanket as you're getting into bed, if you want to convert it into a cape and have a little bit of a... <laughs> A moment, perhaps spend that moment thinking about your Christian freedom, this mantle of freedom that you're gifted in faith. And also perhaps it's good to think about, are there any things at the moment that are holding you back from truly living out the kingdom of God here and now and allowing the fruits of the spirit to speak in your life? And if there are, then perhaps it would be a beautiful symbol just to take that mantle on and say, yes, Holy Spirit, I receive this freedom and please let your fruits live out of my life so that I'm able to live the kingdom here and now and make a way, perhaps even using that mantle to part the waters for others to come on the journey too. So happy cape wearing <laughs> or mantle wearing as it were, and let us truly accept the freedom that Christ gifts to us in faith. Amen.